This video is called How Can I Win My Case Due to Mental Health? The most common way to win a criminal case, and when I say win, I mean to have charges dismissed in a criminal case for mental health, is under what's called Section 32. It's Section 32 of the Mental Health Forensic Provisions Act 1990, and it provides various ways to have a defendant discharged, that is, for them not to have a criminal conviction, not to have a criminal record, because of the fact that they are suffering from a mental illness or a mental condition or some sort of other disorder. Now, the most common part of Section 32 is Section 32.3a, and that provides that a person can be discharged into the care of a person, so for example into the care of a psychologist, so they can come under the, the guise of a, a psychologist's plan, provided that they have a mental condition, and if it's more appropriate to deal with them by way of a treatment plan, then otherwise in accordance with the law. So we rewind a bit here. What occurs is, for example, a person may be charged with an assault some sort of an assault, which of course is a, a serious type of an offence. Now, if the person is suffering from a mental condition, for example, it might be a serious depression or it might be serious anxiety disorder and they may have reacted in those circumstances, or it could be a, a more serious uh, type of a condition or categorised as a more serious type of a condition, such as bipolar or, or chronic schizophrenia or something like that. Whatever the case may be, if a person is suffering from a mental condition, and the magistrate is persuaded that it's more appropriate to deal with them by way of a treatment plan, then a person can avoid a criminal conviction and they can also avoid a finding of guilt. Now, you may have heard of Section 10. That's when you plead guilty to an offence and uh, the magistrate uses their discretion not to give you a criminal conviction. For a Section 10, there's still a finding of guilt, so you're still guilty of the offence. But under Section 32, if the Section 32 application is successful, there's not even a finding of guilt. So it's a very useful mechanism for persons who are suffering from mental conditions. So there is an incident, there is an alleged offence. What occurs then is you may want to see a lawyer. And the lawyer can arrange for what's called a psychological report or a psychiatric report. Now, that psychological report or psychiatric report will have some background about you, will normally have some background about the alleged incident, and it will talk about the condition that you suffer. At the end of the report, though, it will very, very importantly set down what's called a treatment plan. It has to have a treatment plan for you to succeed in these types of matters. Now, a treatment plan, for example, might say that you see your general practitioner and you take any medication as prescribed, that you see your psychologist on a fortnightly basis. It may talk about the fact that you need to undertake cognitive behavioural therapy or whatever it might be. You can talk about the fact that you might need to be reassessed by a psychiatrist after two months' time. It will have certain things in there that you need to comply with if you're dealt with under this particular section. Now, treatment plans can last for up to six months, and these Section 32 orders only last for a maximum of six months. So, step one, uh, you've been charged with the, the offence. Step two, you, you've seen a lawyer. Step three, uh, the lawyer has arranged for a report. So, you've got the report, what happens then? What normally happens on the first day in courts is that the matter will be for a mention, a short court date. Normally, you won't have the final report by that stage, and if you do, often the court will want to set the matter down for a hearing of this application down the track. So it might be four weeks down the track, six weeks down the track, whatever it might be. So the first court date will normally be a mention date. The matter will be set down for a hearing of this Section 32 application. When your lawyer comes before the court for this Section 32 application, they will normally already have served, that is given, the other side, the prosecution, the, which is the police or the DPP, a copy of this report. They normally also will have filed a copy of that report in court. So it's the day of the hearing. What happens then normally is that the magistrates will read the reports 
when they're on the bench, that is when they're sitting up there in the courtroom, or they may even already have read the report earlier on in the day. The magistrate will at that stage have formed some sort of an understanding about what the allegation is, so they will have read the, the police so-called facts as well, so the police allegations, they will have read the report, and sometimes they'll ask the prosecutor, uh, what do you say about all this? The prosecutor might say, look, we, we agree that it's appropriate in this situation, or the prosecutor might say, look, no, we oppose a section 32. In any event, it's normally the case that your lawyer will make submissions to the court. That means we'll argue uh, to the court that you should be given a section 32. You should be dealt with under section 32. Now, in doing that, your lawyer will normally have to show three things. The first thing, the first limb, is that you suffer from a mental condition. And a list of mental conditions is contained by the American, in the American Journal called the DSM-4 or the DSM-5. There's a range of conditions that are specified in there. Normally, the report will say, um, the person suffers from uh, extreme anxiety or extreme depression, whatever it might be, which is a condition according to the DSM-4 or the DSM-5. It will normally say that in the report. That's the first thing that your lawyer has to establish, that you suffer from a mental condition. The second and more importantly, more important thing that your lawyer has to establish, that it is more appropriate to deal with you by way of a treatment plan than otherwise in accordance with the law. So. It's in the community's interests to deal with you by way of diverting you away from the criminal justice system, pursuant to a treatment plan. It's in the community's interest, and those interests outweigh the interests in punishing you, the normal interests of criminal justice system, which is punishment, deterrence, those types of things. Now, in weighing those things against each other, the court will normally look at the seriousness of the offence, the prevalence of the offence in the community. The court will normally also have a look at whether there's a link between the, the condition and the commission of the offence itself. For example, if I was hallucinating, uh, if I suffered from a hallucinogenic condition, I was hallucinating and I was punching around and I hit someone because I thought that devils were following me or something like that, there's a clear link there between my condition and the acts that I did. That's a clear link. Things like that the, mag the magistrate can take into account, but very, very importantly, the magistrate also has to take into account the other factors, deterring people from doing this, punishment for the offence itself. So the magistrate weighs those factors against each other in determining whether to deal with a person under Section 32. The magistrate can also have a look at how mentally ill the person is in making that assessment. So there's a range of considerations that the magistrate can take into account in determining whether to deal with you under Section 32. Now, as I've already said, Section 32 is a very beneficial section to be dealt with under because there's no conviction, there's no finding of guilt, and you can be released, discharged, and you can get on with your life. I've spoken also about the two limbs of Section 32. Number one, that there's a mental condition. Number two, it's more appropriate to deal with you by way of a treatment plan than otherwise in accordance with the law. The third is, there has to be a treatment plan, and it has to be a sufficient treatment plan. I've spoken about the treatment plan. The treatment plan should not just say, oh, I think he should go into treatment or something like that. It has to, or it should, list various things that you need to do over the next six months to address any underlying conditions. Now, what are the benefits of having a lawyer in these types of situations, whether it's us or another experienced lawyer? The benefits are the lawyer can properly brief the medical practitioner, so the psychologist or the psychiatrist, and can guide them about the things that they need to address, including the treatment plan. The lawyer can negotiate with the, this with the other side, so try and get the prosecution to agree that this is an appropriate matter for a Section 32. The lawyer can also present the case most persuasively in court and try to argue that really it's not in the community's interest to punish you in the traditional way. It's more in the community's interest to have you diverted, have you addressed the underlying conditions so that it's unlikely that you might offend in the future. This is a basic rundown of Section 32 applications.